Tales from the Shortcake Trilogy Tipping Point by Christopher Gorm Calvin Spoiler Warnings Minor Spoilers for Shortcake Major Spoilers for Shortcake Impulse Reborn Major Spoilers for Pendant of God Mark sat on the vinyl bar stool and rested an elbow on the dark wooden slab before him. A muted replay of last night's football game graced the television mounted with an eye shot of his seat. The bartender had spotted him, but was busy closing the tab of the only other patron in at this time of day. It didn't matter, because Mark didn't have anywhere else to be right now. I'll need to see some ID, the bartender said when he approached a few moments later. Even if I only order a nice tea, Mark asked. The bartender eyed him curiously. You came here for a nice tea? You could have hit the local burger joint for that. My friend picked the location. He'll be here soon. Now can I have an iced tea or not? The bartender made a face that suggested he didn't care for Mark's attitude, but then he nodded and prepped a glass. Mark didn't know why he had started a beef with the man right out of the gate. He'd been doing that a lot lately, finding himself short-tempered even when a situation didn't call for it. He'd always been a bit of a hothead, but this was different. It was as if his tolerance for others had taken a permanent dip, which was odd considering he'd been generally happy with the direction his life had been taking, at least until that incident in the Red Room. Mark Skarsberg, he heard his friend yell from the bar's entrance. How the hell have you been? Mark stood to welcome his friend with their usual bro hug, a firm clasp of hands followed by a cross-body chest bump and pat on the back. It was as heterosexual as a hug could get, the primary reason they had developed the maneuver when they were kids, a time when getting unjustifiably teased for being gay was still a thing, and before Mark had begun his streak of dating one attractive girl after another. Though infantile teasing was no longer a concern, the bro hug had become a staple of their friendship that had withstood the test of time. "'What'll it be, Mikey?' the bartender asked. "'The usual,' Mikey replied without hesitation as he took a seat. Mark scanned his friend from head to toe. He had the typical preppy college student look, though with perhaps a little more edge than average. He also wasn't known for his ventures into alcoholism, and to the best of Mark's knowledge, he was more likely to smell of fine cologne than booze. But the bartender had known him by name, had just delivered his usual drink, and, perhaps the biggest insult, hadn't asked for proof of age. Mikey slammed the drink back, then pushed his glass forward for a refill. Is there something going on I need to know about? Mark asked. No? Why? You just seem... thirstier than normal. Mikey eyed his empty glass, which the bartender was coming to replace. That? No, man. I stop in here about once a week with some college buddies who are always determined to get me shit-faced. I come on my own every other week or so to build up a tolerance so they never succeed. Wouldn't be easier to tell them you don't want a drink? Mikey laughed. I suppose, but you know, peer pressure and all that jazz. The bartender had swapped his glass for a fresh one, but this time Mikey sipped at the drink instead of plowing it down. So how have you been? The last time we spoke, you were gearing up for that internship you'd been dreaming about and working out a plan to get your girl back. How'd those go? The internship doesn't start until the end of the semester, and Stacy... Mark paused, the image of his most recent, longest-lasting and final girlfriend lingering in his mind. I really thought I had her. I probably would have had her, but then some psychopath had to blow up the red room just as I was making my move. Mikey's eyes widened. You were there? Mark pushed back a wave of hair, displaying his memento from the event, an ugly scar etched across his forehead. Mikey grimaced and took a swig of his drink. The worst part is that her doofus of a boyfriend is the one who saved me. Mark said, letting his hair fall back into place. Apparently, I was in a daze and bleeding out. He was the one who had me put pressure on my wound and directed me to the exit. Or so I've been told. That sucks. You couldn't play the sympathy card to keep Stacy on the hook? Have her tend to your wounds, if you know what I'm saying? Mikey poked Mark playfully. Mark pushed his hand away. We're still friends, but that ship sailed the moment the doofus saved her life, too. There's nothing I can do to break them up now. You could kill him, Mikey said nonchalantly. Mark looked at his friend, who appeared astonishingly serious. In truth, violence against Derek had crossed his mind on more than one occasion. But those had been pipe dreams, the machinations of an immature, testosterone-infused mind. 
it was nothing Mark would actually act upon. Luckily, Mikey broke into a wide grin, alleviating the tension that there had been any substance behind the suggestion. That's not funny, Mark said. You should have seen your face. Mikey laughed until the point of exhaustion, then downed his second drink. This time, he didn't push it forward for a refill, and instead reached into his pants pocket. Look, I can't help you with your girl problems, but if your internship isn't enough to keep you riding high on life, I can offer you this. He pulled out a plastic baggie just large enough to hold a handful of pills. Mikey held the baggie low as Mark eyed the collection of identical pale blue tablets within. I don't need your ADHD meds, he said. Tisk, tisk, tisk. Mikey responded with a disapproving head shake. I got off the ADHD meds years ago. This is something new. Something that'll knock your socks off and leave you thinking they're in another town. Mark held up his hand, signaling he didn't want to hear any more. Put it away. I'm not your daddy and I won't tell you how to live your life, but you know how I feel about illegal street drugs. That's just it, Mikey replied. This stuff isn't street. This is circulating among high society. Golden parachute executives, rich out of their asses celebrities, their spoiled rotten frat boy children, high maintenance girlfriends, you name it. Everyone who's anyone is giving this stuff a try, and most of them like it. Seriously, I'm not interested. Suit yourself. Mikey slipped the baggie back into his pocket. If you ever change your mind, I won't. Mark cut him off. Now drop it. Okay, okay. Mikey pushed his empty glass forward to signal the bartender, who had a third drink ready to go. After taking another large gulp, he said, I guess that means the internship's satisfying enough. Remind me where it is again? It's... Mark's words caught in his throat as his eyes noticed an abrupt change on the television overhead. The graphics for a breaking news alert flashed across the screen. Then the image was replaced by a wide shot of New York City's skyline. Plumes of smoke rose from some sort of destruction on the ground. What should have been a sunny blue sky overhead was marred by blood-red gashes, behind which stars glimmered before falling toward the ground. The image switched again, this time to a static shot of the ground, where the streets had been abandoned and litter and other light objects were tossed around by hurricane-strength winds. The image switched a third time, now to a rooftop camera overlooking the destruction. The camera zoomed in on a modern skyscraper Mark recognized as Cannes Tower. There. Mikey glanced at the television, then did a double take as the destruction on display set in. There? You mean New York? I mean right there, Mark clarified. Cannes Tower. Then to the bartender, he asked, Hey, can you turn the volume up? He was already on it, and a second later, the voiceover from a female reporter filled the bar. We're still not sure what phenomenon we're witnessing. It's as if lightning has torn open the sky and the heavens themselves are raining down on the city. The highest concentration of activity is around Cannes Tower, leaving some to speculate that it's the source of this catastrophe. Sure enough, Mark could see a bright pinpoint of light in the center of a machine rigged to the roof of Cannes Tower. All around, blinding specks were searing through buildings as they fell from the sky gashes, setting New York ablaze. What the hell? Mikey muttered. Mark agreed. It certainly looked like hell. There was activity on the roof of Cannes Tower, people by the look of it, and a helicopter hovering nearby. The glowing pinpoint in the machine faded, and for a moment, Mark thought the Armageddon besieging New York would cease. But then came the explosion, an ungodly fireball that seemed to fill the television before the cameraman zoomed out to capture its full scope. The upper portion of Cannes Tower had been incinerated, Debris from the remaining damaged floors was plummeting down from a cloud of smoke so enormous and dense it blocked out the sky for at least five square blocks. But as the smoke cleared, so did the hellscape hovering over Manhattan, and within minutes, sunlight began to make its triumphant return. Jesus, Mikey said before turning to Mark. Good thing that internship hadn't started yet. Yeah. It was the only response Mark could muster. Mikey was right. Had Mark been there, he might be dead right now. Then again, he'd been staking his entire future on his internship with Cannes International, and there was a good chance that future had just been incinerated with the rest of its headquarters. When weighing the prospects of no future versus death, it was hard for Mark to pick a clear victor. I'm going to get out of here, he told Mikey. Yeah, sure. Call me later to catch up. Mark went straight home and began making phone calls. 
He knew it was pointless, given the larger chaos that had to be underway both inside Cannes International and across New York City as a whole, but he needed to feel like he was doing something to maintain control of his life. After hours of busy signals being put on hold but never returned to, and speaking with people who informed him he would need to be patient, Mark gave up for the night. He resumed his calls the next morning, but to no more luck. Weeks went by, with Mark hanging in limbo regarding the status of his internship. During that time, he followed news reports of the aftermath of Cannes International's destruction, as well as the death of its founder and CEO, Porter Cannes. It sounded as though the company would be dismantled and sold for parts, though there was a slim chance internal leadership would step in to save it. But before that possibility played out, the letter came. Mark recognized the logo next to the return address before he even read whom it was from. He hurried into his house, tore it open, and skimmed for one of two phrases he knew he would find there. As soon as his eyes saw, we regret to inform you, the flame of any remaining hope within him was extinguished. Mark dropped the letter onto the floor and collapsed against his living room couch. He felt his heart beating erratically, saw black spots overtaking his vision, and suddenly felt the weight of life itself pressing on his shoulders. Then all went silent. When Mark woke, it took him a moment to remember what had happened. Maybe it had been a heart attack, or simply a panic attack, maybe even a stroke. Whatever it had been, it had knocked him out of commission for at least two hours by the shift of sunlight across his living room windows. Mark spotted the letter on the floor. He was tempted to read it again, considering maybe he had jumped to the wrong conclusion, that something else in the letter would reignite the hope that had been lost. But he knew better. The best thing he could do now was move on, and to do that, he needed to sever himself completely from what could have been. Mark grabbed the letter and marched into his kitchen. He cranked one of the burners of his gas stove, then pushed a corner of the letter into its blue flame. Once it had ignited, Mark transferred the letter to the kitchen sink, where he set it against the smooth metal basin and watched it burn. Mark's dreams had become ash, but from that ash would rise a phoenix, a bird that would soar to greater heights than he had ever previously imagined. He just needed the willpower and conviction to make it happen. But first, he needed an escape from his current sorrow. Mark picked up his phone and dialed Mikey. Hey, he said when his friend answered. It's me. Let's meet up tonight. Same place as last time. Mark paused a moment as he waited for Mikey to agree. Then he added, Oh, and bring that baggie of yours. It's time for a reinvention. And I know just where to start.